welcome to the Books on Asia podcast, sponsored by Stonebridge Press, publisher of Fine Books on Asia for over 30 years, located at www.stonebridge.com. And I'm your host, Amy Chavez. And this week, we're talking to writer and translator William Scott Wilson about his book, Walking the Kiso Road. When Barry Lancet and I met last time to do home podcast number four about Tokyo, Bill tagged along and expressed a desire to appear on the podcast. So I'm delighted to be able to feature his work on home podcast five, Hiking, Pilgrimages, and Journeys in Japan. So this was an impromptu discussion among Barry, Bill, and myself. So today we have a special guest that Barry has brought with him, and this is someone that many of our listeners will have heard of and have read his books. So who is it, Barry? Bill Wilson, officially known as William Scott Wilson, if you want to go by his full name. He's author and translator of of countless books at this point, some of which we worked on together. Yes. I'm so excited because I did not expect to meet Bill today, so this is really nice. I read your uh, Kiso Road. Yes. And um, found that very helpful and interesting, and I love doing uh, pilgrimages and trails myself, so um, I really enjoyed that. Well, I started decades ago um, with a uh, book of samurai philosophy, a man who lived in the uh, early, well, he died around 1715, I believe, and he wrote a book called Hagakure, probably the most radical of all the uh, samurai philosophy books. And uh, I translated that. Uh, Kodansha was uh, kind enough to publish it. And then I sort of kept doing samurai material for a number of years and then kind of branched out to other other subjects. Bill uh, has, uh, he specializes in classic and tra- mostly translating classic Japanese books and sometimes Chinese books and he's but he's also written including the Kiso Road Walking the Kiso Road Walking the Kiso Road and then another original book that he wrote is he wrote uh, a book about Miyamoto Musashi which is just brilliant it's a wonderful book it's a the only English biography around basically and he's very hard to write about because there's so little information about him but that's quite an exceptional volume. Though. Yeah, another one of the heroes of Japan. Right, the famous samurai who. Well, he was a he was a swordsman who uh, practiced his practiced his uh, art throughout his life, and uh, I sort of argued with one of the editors that he should not be called a samurai because samurai means to serve, and it means to serve a lord. Musashi never really served any particular lord. He was always very independent. Toward the end of his life, he was a guest of the Lord of the uh, in Kyushu, the Hosokawa. But uh, he was, I guess you would say, he was a bushi. He was a warrior, and more than that, he was just a swordsman and an artist. He not only was a uh, uh, a swordsman, but he was also an art uh, a sumie, you know, ink India ink paintings, which he's very famous for under the name of Niten. And there are people who admire his work as a painter and don't know that he was Musashi the swordsman. Oh, really? Uh, He also designed gardens and uh, a number of other things. Um, He's most famous, of course, for his very short book called The the Book of Five Rings, Goring no Sho, which is used for just about everything from learning how to uh, handle a sword to different sorts of... uh, uh, as a way of life, really. The first translation of it was touted as the uh, MBA for uh, Tokyo Daigaku. <laughs> it's not a book about business. No, it's <laughs> and, absolutely not. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was a great advertising ploy to say that. And all these businessmen went out and read it in order to keep up uh, with the, uh, the Japanese. No, I thought it was very amusing, though, that they sort of took this old classic and decided to use it. The, the lines in it has kind of rallying cries for various yes. business practices, which was a little bizarre to watch from these shores. Yes. Well, I did a number on uh, different uh, uh, warrior philosophies. Of when uh, Hagakure first came out, people were saying, well, this is it. This is the, uh, the warrior philosophy. And it's not. It's one of many different opinions as to what Bushido, or the way of the warrior, is. So I did a couple of books of uh, anthologies of different, um, actually different warlords, 
um, and their opinions on what Bushido was. That was interesting. I have done one of a, uh, a samurai doctor who lived about the same time as the author of Hagakure, who found that the, uh, the warrior clans were sort of weakening, or the warriors themselves were weakening because the, it was a time of peace and they didn't have to really do much. So towards the end of his life, he put together a book of uh, how to stay healthy. This is a very interesting book. It's called the Yojo-kun. And, the uh, Yojo-kun. Yo Yojo-kun. And uh, it was aimed at the warriors, but it soon became a, a very popular book with everyone from the uh, upper classes down to the, uh, to the very lower classes. And I had a, a Japanese friend who grew up during the war, and he said that book was really their Bible as to how to stay healthy really? right after the war and during the war because the food was, was uh, so scarce. I also did a translation of the Tao Te Ching, Lao Tzu's famous uh, book, which I really enjoyed. I tried to look up as many of the archaic characters as possible, not the characters you see these days. And uh, I've done a number of different others. The, the uh, Walking the Kiso Road is one of my favorites. Is it? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. I, I can pick it up and read it, and I can be back on the Kiso Road just by reading it. So I've done a number of different, uh, uh, different kinds of books. So how did it, uh, the idea come around for a book for the Kisa Road? Well, a friend of mine had introduced uh, the post town of Tsumago to me years ago. And I was went back... Was that before it was all revitalized? No, it's been revitalized really since the 70s. But uh, I went back with my wife once and by myself a couple times. When I changed my publishing house to, uh, with the loss of Kodanchi International, I went to Shambhala and um, they wanted to interview me before they actually signed me up so i went up to boston and uh, the editors and i all sat around drinking you know eating sushi and drinking sake and getting a little high and i was telling them about this fantastic road in japan and uh, about six months later i got a call from my editor and she said look we would uh, like you to do a book on the kiso road and i said fine i'll come up and talk to you about it she said no no need for that we've already decided they gave me uh, an advance, and I put a rucksack on and spent three weeks walking what could you could be you could do it. I think my wife and I did it in ten days, probably less than that. But I decided to really stay at each post town and try to get a good feeling for it and and talk to people. To, so that's really how it came about. They decided they wanted the book, and I was overjoyed because it gave me a chance to go back and and to uh, really kind of sink my teeth into it. If you yeah, because. Reading the book, it sounds like you had been there at least once before, if not a couple times, in some of the places you stayed. Yes, I'd been on the Kiso uh, three, four, five times. Um, but I was extremely lucky. I, when I went on this trip just for the book, I couldn't get into the inn that I wanted to get in. And uh, I went to another one that's not so old, only 50 years old, the Tsuchikawaya. And as it turned out, the man who ran the place was an expert on the Kiso Road, and he had a library full of books in Japanese. And he brought them into my room while I was there, and I wrote down titles. And I was so excited about one that I called up a friend and asked him to bring me a copy of the book in Sumago in one of the other post towns. Uh, he did, and uh, it was just a marvelous source. It was Walking the Kiso Road, uh, Imamukashi now and days and uh, you know years ago and uh, it was a marvelous source so when i finished i went back to miami and uh, i worked six months or a year i can't really remember because i was so involved in it but uh, i had a number of sources in japanese that uh, really helped out in the end it wasn't just bill wilson who was walking the kiso road it was poets that had walked it hundreds of years ago, samurai who had walked it, spies for the Edo government who had walked it. And at that time it was walked because that was the only way to get around, right? Well, it wasn't the only one. And, uh, no, there were many. There was, yes, there was the Tokaido. But uh, the Tokaido involved crossing a number of rivers and, and bodies of water. And, you know, people were not great swimmers then. And uh, although the Kiso was cold and, and uh, dark, it was a, a really preferred uh, route. It was a really interesting time because the government had pretty much cleared up the problem of, uh, of robbers and people on the road. And uh, the uh, economy of the country had, had really 
uh, improved. So all of a sudden, there were thousands of people on the road, mm -hmm. walking. Uh, there were uh, samurai walking, there were businessmen walking, there were peddlers walking, prostitutes, there were uh, wives that just picked up and left. Um, there <laughs> were children. Was, yeah, that was an interesting bit you had in the book about about wives. They didn't go alone. They, they would get together in groups, right? Yes, much. they and got together they in groups. decided they were going. And there was, at the pra back then, there was a practice of, of taking a pilgrimage. So under the guise sure. of going on a pilgrimage, which is hard for anybody to argue with. Right? Two roads, the Tokaido Line and the uh, Nakasendo, or the Kisokaido, uh, were very popular places to walk. And as a result, the little post towns along the way uh, became very prosperous. And um, the post town, for example, of Narai, which now has maybe five or six ryokans or inns to stay in, at that time had 33, over mm -hmm. 33 inns. And it's just a little tiny town. It's just a few hundred yards long. So that's how the book got started and that's really how I did it, was just, as I say, talking to people. And I was very lucky because along the way I met a number of people who uh, were very happy to share their information. And uh, Shimazaki Tosan also is from... Tosan was from uh, Magome. Magome, right? Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. yes, uh, the uh, his book Before the Dawn, Yoake Mai, is a wonderful book. Uh, about that lower part of uh, of the Kiso Road, just at the time that Meiji period was uh, beginning to to kind of modernize. Yeah, the I read that book also before I went. Well, it's a, it's a huge book. I didn't read the whole thing, but I certainly read the first part of it, and um, stayed in that temple there. Yes, yes, I've stayed there myself. Yeah, I thought so because yes. then when I had yours, I thought, oh my gosh, we're all in the same place. And yes, especially <laughs> I even noticed that the scroll. Patience. Patience, that was it. Patience, yes. Sorry. The, the scroll that the was The blade patience over a heart. Was, um, had been moved from the room out into the uh, dining area. Ah, so. So I'll have to send you uh, my Japan Times column that I wrote Oh, about, please do, yes. About it, yeah. <laughs> okay. It was funny, and uh, what an interesting place. That was a gorgeous little temple. I was the only one staying yes. there. And a, a number of people did not know about it because it's about, you know, 50 yards away from, from the... Uh, the Kiso Road, the main road that goes up through Magome. Well, also they've changed the name of the temple. Is that so? Yeah. Oh. It's not the same one as it was in Tosan's book. Um, and the, there's that nice museum there, too, of Shibazaki Yes, the Tosan, Tosan Museum. It's very interesting. Yeah. The connection with the horse in that town? All of the uh, Emmas have the horse on them. And there's some... Uh, uh, Nagano Prefecture, and particularly the Kiso area, has been famous for horses for hundreds of years. Yeah, uh, there are, are several places that are, are famous for horses, and all along the way, as you know, uh, you'll find these Buddhist uh, statues, uh, sometimes protective figures, sometimes just various Buddhist statues, and one of the most popular is the uh, Bato Kanon, or the horse-headed Kanon, and uh, you'll see her here and there, and it's a regular Kanon, and just on the top of her, her head is a, a small horse's head. I and also saw a very nice uh, shrine to cows. I thought oh, that was really? really beautiful, yeah. Oh. And it had just thanked the cows who they had used to transfer goods back and forth through the uh, This is on the Magome Pass, I believe, from mm -hmm. Magome over to uh, uh, Tsumago. Yes, I remember that. And, uh, and you understand it because the, the trail is so steep and so narrow. You wonder how did the, these animals cross this trail? What did they use the horses for in those days? Did they well, ride them? Well, some of the upper-class samurai certainly rode them. Mm -hmm. Well, um, they would have been on the trail on <coughs> horses, wouldn't they? On have? horses, yes. Mm -hmm. um, were the, there were pack horses that uh, crossed the trail or not? I, I, I'm not sure, but uh, there were merchants, of course, that used the trail. And a lot of the merchants carried their goods on their backs if they were peddlers, but the, more, the richer uh, merchants had horses and... Well, here's something interesting. I have a diary of my great-great-grandfather when he came to Japan in 1900. Really? And one of the things he wrote about was how the ponies had sandals. For the snow. Oh, for the snow. Yes, okay. you'll see that in some of the places on the Kiso Road, just off to the side. They're kind of like boots, <laughs> really, that come They're up straw, about ankle. right? They're made out of straw. 
Uh, which is another interesting point because most of the samurai that uh, crossed the uh, the Kiso Road and the whole Nakasendo wore straw sandals. And it's rough enough in hiking boots, but I can't imagine it in straw sandals. That produced an industry along the Kiso Road of people that would actually make straw sandals because your sandals were worn out by the time you got to the next uh, post town. Parts of the trail that were cobbled stone. Yes. Right? I mean, those are hard to walk on. They are, and you and, think uh, about animals on those too, yeah. and you think, hmm. Also, they use straw sandals on the Shikoku pilgrimage. Is that so? Yeah. So yeah. there's a theme yeah. running here. <laughs> mm-hmm. Maybe they just needed to employ the sandal makers. Yes. <laughs> and, I mean, it was either straw or wood, and, and straw is much more flexible when you're walking on those kind of rough surfaces, particularly if it's, it's the rough hewn stone passages. Imagine they ended up, I always thought when I, I've walked on some of those, I always thought they've had, um, they must have gotten a number of people that twisted their ankles on those things because they're really, really hard to walk on. Yeah, the Kumano Kodo is the same yeah. as well. Survived it several times, but without to... straw sandals, I did have boots. <laughs> yes. I would like to do the entire Nakasendo someday. Of course, between Sumago and uh, Magome, it's gorgeous. And I went a bit further to Ninai. Not an official post town, but it may have been a small village along the way. Yeah. Does it eventually go out onto, like, the highway and roads? Well, here and there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there are parts that uh, you're next to the highway for maybe 500 yards or something like that, and then there are parts that all of a sudden disappear up into the mountains on the Ishi Tatami, you know, the uh, stone pavements right. that were laid down in the 1600s. And it's, so, yes, you, your, your scenery is quite varied, but there are wonderful parts all the way. Uh, up to the end of the Kiso Road, which is uh, uh, Niekawa is uh, officially the first post town coming up the Kiso from uh, from the north, and you walk along a hill that o- overlooks the highway as you do that. But then it begins to disappear into yeah. forests and uh, small little villages and uh, populated areas. But the, there are parts of it that are stunningly beautiful. So when you walk and stay overnight, do you just rock up somewhere when you're ready to uh, stay overnight, well, or do you just go post town to post town, or you go post town to post town because they're really uh, some of them are only three and a half miles apart. Um, going over the Tori Toge, the Tori Pass, I think it's no more than three and a half to four miles. But of course, it's <laughs> it's up over this pass, which is a a pretty difficult one. Uh, there are others that are maybe seven or eight miles long, but uh, it, it's not terribly difficult on any particular uh, walk between the post towns. And, and that course, would be ten days, you said? Well, there's eleven post towns, so it depends on how long you want to stay. You could do it in ten days if you wished, or you could do it as I did in three weeks the last time I did it, and just stay and really get the atmosphere of, of each town because there are always many, many things to see. There are several, for example, in the, the little village of Narai, there are several beautiful temples there. Uh, when you go to Kiso Fukushima, there's the barrier, the old barrier that uh, people had to line up, sometimes wait for days to, to pass through. At Niekawa, which is just which burned down, I think, in the 50s, and now just a few houses left there, there's a, a very nice museum with uh, Jomon pottery and, and uh, that sort of thing, that, you know, the ancient peoples that lived here. The Jomon people lived along the Kiso a couple thousand years before uh, the, the uh, modern Japanese did. I totally understand like going and spending your time, especially if you're writing, because I've found that you can't really even write about a place until you've already been there once and almost done like the course, mm-hmm. because you, if you're just not prepared and there's so many things to find out and there's so many mistakes to be made <laughs> well, the first helps, time around. It helps to have been there a couple of times because then you're aware you of the places. Of the well, you're aware of the places that you can then go back to and see with a little bit more of an eye for detail and that sort of thing. Like the first time I went to Narai, I went to this very nice temple and I walked around. But when I went back to the same temple, uh, I was fortunate enough to meet up with the uh, the wife of the head priest. And so she more or less kind of gave me a nice little lecture about the place as we went from room to room into the garden and uh, around and about. So these are the advantages of, of either doing it several times or reading a book, like walking the Kiso Road, so you know, you have an idea of where to go. Yeah. 
And have you uh, done any of the other trails in Japan? Uh, I have not. Um, uh, in the 50 years that I came to Japan and lived here and went back and lived here and went back, uh, I had a wonderful friend by the name of uh, Ichikawa Takashi, who was a, uh, a mountain climber. And he took me on any number of, of mountains uh, mm -hmm. over those years. Uh, one of them being Mount Ontake, which is on the Kiso. And uh, that's an interesting story. We went up the mountain, and it's a sacred mountain. It's the mountain itself is a god. But we went up the mountain, and uh, we got to the caldera, and there was this kind of smell of sulfur. And if you looked over the caldera, there were these flumes of sulfur smoke coming up, like an entrance to hell almost. <laughs> and uh, I said to Ichikawa-san, I said, you know, is this about to go? And he said, no, don't worry, it hasn't, uh, <laughs> it hasn't erupted for 6,000 years. And I thought, geological time, 6,000 years is not a whole lot. But we slowly made our way down. And two weeks later, I was in my little office, uh, my little study in Miami, and I picked up the newspaper, and uh, Mount Ontake had erupted. Wow. <laughs> yes, that was interesting. <laughs> but um, as far as trails go, no, not really. But, you know, a lot of mountains like Kamikoche and, and Haksan and, and uh, a number of places. I was very fortunate to have this friend, Ichikawa, that took me round and about. Yeah. It's always great to have a local, isn't it? Yes. Mm -hmm. I could say that my very first trail was my introduction to Japan, which was a, a kayak trip from Shimonoseki to Tokyo. Wow, that yeah. is a long way it, to kayak. 12, it was 1,200 miles and two and a half months, and there were 10 of us, five two-man ocean-going kayaks. We went through the inland sea, around the key peninsula and then up to Tokyo. That was my introduction to Japan. I'd never been here before, but what, Now, what could, year was that? That was 1966. Okay, so that was in the 60s is what when uh, Donald Ritchie did his trip. I, think uh, I can't remember. I know he has a book out about the Inland Sea, but this was a, a marvelous trip. You never see a country like you do when you're only two inches above the water line. We stopped in of course, any number of little fishing villages um, stopped in a number of larger cities, uh, camped out a number of times. The Inland Sea itself is just, as you know, it's full of islands. Some mm -hmm. of them bigger, you know, no bigger than this room, and some of them huge, like Shikoku. And then you get in, you round the key peninsula, and you're in the Pacific Ocean, which is yet another, right. another another story. So that was a marvelous trip. Well, the Inland Sea would have been very uh, easy to kayak as well, because it's a very calm sea. Yes, it can be. Windy, maybe. <laughs> it can roughen up, and um, mm -hmm. we did yeah. hit one typhoon while we were there, mm -hmm. so we had to pull in and stay in a fishing village for, uh, for three mm -hmm. days. And we hit another typhoon in Shionomisaki, which is, as you know, maybe the, the bottom point of the Key Peninsula. And there we stayed for another three days before we set out again. But the... Uh, these kayaks were mahogany ply, Swedish made You're ocean kidding. going kayaks. Wow. They were incredible craft. They were ocean going kayaks. Fishermen who have to be their own carpenters in these small isolated villages would see these kayaks and they were just dumbfounded by what beautiful work they were. And I remember one village we came into late in the evening and the little kids saw us from the you know, the, the, the shore and they go, Gaijin, Gaijin, foreigners, foreigners and everybody came running down. And, you know, we all, you know, well, here we are. And they said, oh, my gosh, why are you here for? And then three or four of the fishermen got a look at our kayaks, and they more or less pushed us aside, friendly enough, and looked up inside of the kayaks through the cockpits. And I'll never forget, they were gently laughing at what great woodwork it was. Yeah. Because they have to be their own carpenters, and they could see that the carpenters, yeah. the shipbuilders that had done these kayaks were very, very talented people. And they would have respected that. Yes, very much so. So that was, you know, enlightening in itself. That's amazing. That's a great trip. Wow. That's the book I want to read. Yes, there is no book. There is a, a, uh, a National Geographic that came out in September of uh, 1967, and you can still get right. it online. <laughs> yes. All right, uh, I will look it up. But, uh, perhaps Sounds someday good. I could try and bring back those memories and <laughs> yeah. write something of it. It's, 
I've sailed up and down the Inland Sea many, many times. Oh, how nice. How wonderful. Um, and it's still very undiscovered for anyone in a boat. It's surprising. And only the real, the real salties come up to Japan from the south, from like the Philippines and Australia, oh. and because of the Kuroshio current. Yes. It's, it's a bear. Mm. And the weather actually isn't very, you know, boat friendly, <coughs> is it, in Japan with all the typhoons? Yes. They only come up through the inland sea if they're going to Alaska, and I'm going to head that way. Uh -huh. And even then, you have to wait for the right season. There's only like a six-week window mm -hmm. when you can leave in the springtime from the uh -huh. inland sea and make it before it gets too cold and the winds and you know, rough weather and we did notice that change of temperature by the way as we uh, rounded the key peninsula from the uh, inland sea to the pacific uh, we noticed that the, mm, the water is getting a little chilly here this well is... yeah and also that's exactly where the current is the kudoshio yes. and uh, that's what gives them all that nice tuna which mm -hmm. they have at the big markets at the yes. key peninsula at the end of the kumanokoro yeah in uh, key katsura um, yeah, so that's, I think that point is, uh, can be kind of treacherous as well from what I hear. Well, there's the Naruto Straits, which have the, the big whirlpools, and we did kayak right through them. That's pretty good. Um, you would have done that at high, high tide, the highest I tide. I can't remember what tide it was, yeah. but we were, we were five kayaks, as I say, and one of the kayaks wasn't able to do that one day. They went ahead to film us or something to that effect. We had a, a motion picture camera guy with us uh, for National Geographic magazine. And as we're going through these Naruto Straits and there are these whirlpools and these upswellings, we're of course being very, very careful and we're very nervous and suddenly the Kaijo Huancho, the Maritime Safety Agency, is almost right next to us in a huge boat and they're saying, attention, Americans, you only have four boats where is the other boat? You are going in dangerous territory. Say, yes, we know, we know, we know where they are. It's okay. Please leave us alone. We're right. trying to get through this. Right. That, was, that was probably the scariest part of the trip. That reminds <laughs> me of one time sailing around um, the Kansai airport. Mm. You know, we were just sailing around, and suddenly this, like the Hoancho, like you said, this boat comes up and starts yelling at us through Basically a speaker. Basically the coast, coast Guard sort the of thing. The Coast Guard. Yeah and saying, get out, you're too close to the airport. Oh. like, we are? Yes. <laughs> I mean, it didn't seem we, like we were so close at all, but uh. they really, really police it. Yeah, and I can imagine. even now there's lots of Coast Guard up and down the inland sea. Oh, um, really? Yeah, yes. it's surprising, and many more than there used to be. Oh. Well, those, how, how dangerous are those? Uh, I've seen photographs of them. The whirlpools? The, the whirlpools, yeah, I mean... Can a kayak in a kayak, it would that? be dangerous because yeah. you don't have a motor to, to get you through. And you have to go at the highest tide because the thing about the inland sea, as you uh, correctly said before, it empties out onto the Pacific. Yes. Right? And so there are two, well, actually three in all, uh, entrances into the inland sea. Mm -hmm. And they're narrow. So as a result, when the tides change every day, all that water rushes in and then it rushes out again. And plus, there are all these islands in the Inland Sea, so that means the water has to go around those islands, so it also makes for very strong currents, which you would have run into those, yes. and eddies, of course. Yes. So that was pretty brave. Oh, yes. Yeah, yes, you see were. old prints, old um, uh, hanga, That's right, wood yeah. prints, and you can see the, the Naruto right. Straits. That's true. When I went through them on my little boat, which is only 21 feet, we have a you know a larger uh, yacht, but I had my motor, so you know you can kind of get through there. Mm. And of course, there are also big uh, cargo ships, aren't yes, there? there are. You have to dodge those. So yes. I just can't imagine in a in a kayak. We were pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, our great grandfather before, but he came through on a boat, mm -hmm. and he said that they took on a captain before they went into the inland sea. Oh, is that because so? Because if you yes. don't know the inland sea, you can really get in trouble. Yes. And it's quite true. It's all uh, local knowledge, and the fishermen think nothing of just leaving nets out with no lights on them mm -hmm. at night. I mean, most of them will have lights, but not all of them. There will be shoals. There will be you know, just things every now and then. I'll <laughs> look across the, the sea, and it'll be low tide. I'll be somewhere. And there will just be a rock sticking out at the lowest tide. Yes. So that means that when, that, when the tide comes up, that is quickly covered up and 
Yeah, you could hit that thing if you didn't yes. know. We actually have hit one big boulder. And we went back and looked on the sea charts. We're like, oh, yeah, there it is. This little <laughs> tiny pinpoint. <laughs> so, yeah, you do have to be careful. Please write that book. It's not too late. Yes. <laughs> yes, Bill. <laughs> yes, Do you Bill. have diaries and stuff from the time? Oh, heavens no. Oh, okay. I get, well, yes. Yeah. God knows where they are at this point. That was some time ago, 1966. Mm-hmm. Um, I oh. was... Yeah, I'll look up the... Uh, 22, and I'm 74 now, so that's... <laughs> that's great, that 22. Jeez. Oh, how old were you when you came to Japan, Barry? I'm trying to think when the first time I came. I think I might have been around 22 as well. Long time after him, but uh, uh, after Bill, but yeah, I think I was around the same age. Yeah, yeah, I came at twenty two. I came back at twenty three. I went to Europe, came back, and then uh, came back again five years later, for good. Yeah, and you're still here. And Bill moved back. Uh, I come and go, and come and go. I live, yes, I live in Miami, Florida now. Twenty four types of mosquitoes you have down there. Fifty six. Fifty six. Is that true? Oh, yes. You're kidding. 56 types of mosquito. From here, the conversation degenerates into the minutiae of invasive species in Florida. (laughs) So we've decided to spare you the details. Bill's eyes did light up for a moment, however, when I told him I ran the Shikoku pilgrimage in 1998. Ah, he said. So you're the one who wrote that book. My wife is reading it right now. It's on her nightstand. So I feel we've come full circle here, knowing that we've read each other's books. Thanks for listening to Home, the Books on Asia podcast. You've been listening to the Books on Asia podcast, produced and edited by Michael Palmer. Logo by Alex Kerr. Sponsored by Stonebridge Press, publisher of fine books on Asia for over 30 years. They can be found at www.stonebridge.com. For more interviews, book reviews, and other features, visit the Books on Asia website at booksonasia.net.